assure you. If you're a guest this morning, you probably have received a gift bag, and if you have not, we would very much like to get you one. We, we like to just give you a little bit of information about our church, and we like to get to know you some, so we ask for some back information, that is. And if you would see me at the back of the worship service at the close of the service, I would greatly appreciate that because I'd like to get to know you better. And also on the end of your aisles, you have a black pad, and that is what we call our friendship pad. And I'd like you to take a look at that, write your name or any other information you'd like to impart to us, and then we'll get you counted among us. I'd like to, to draw your attention to a few quick announcements that are in the bulletin. One is there is a membership ex exploration experience today at 5 o'clock. We will be meeting in room 5. If you would like to just explore what it looks like to become a member of this body of believers here at Christ UMC, please meet us there tonight at 5 o'clock. You could see me afterwards to let me know you're coming if you'd like, but we'd love to get you on board with that. Also, we'd like to let you know that there is a sign-up sheet, or not a sign-up sheet, but a list menu of sorts of small groups that are being offered around the theme of the story, and you can jump on board to any one of those groups. You could see me as well, and I'll help get you plugged in if that's, that needs to happen. One uh, quick announcement, youth group will be starting tonight back up for the fall, and they also will be doing the story as part of the theme for the overall church, and we'd like for you all to just jump on board with that. Please invite friends and neighbors, youth, and we'd love to have you all be on that journey as well. And Kids Club is going to be starting next week. So if you know of a kid or are a kid between the ages of kindergarten and sixth grade, we'd love to have you be a part of that. That will run simultaneously with the youth group, making it very family friendly. But, and also we have a small group offered that same night on Sunday nights facilitated by Pastor David and I. And we have waited for this moment for the kids' books to arrive, and they are here. Yay! And they are on the back table. Tendra has taken orders and faithfully will be distributing those out at the close of this service. So pick up your children's resources. Very, very important because we want the kids to know the Bible as well as the adults, and it's written for their age level. Every age level should be on board with us. Um, and then there's also some small group resources as well. If you have not received your book, we're distributing those through the small groups, but we do have a few extra, so see Donita at the close of the service. She'll be in the back. Now, without further ado, so much going on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do invite your presence more officially among us. And we are so thrilled to be in your house of worship. I pray that not a one of us would leave having not encountered the living Christ. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing.
have declared your majesty through the creation, and it is good, as you said, on that day of creation. It is very good. And even if we didn't have the Bible, but hallelujah, we do. Even if we didn't, we could see his glory in all that he has created. And I don't know about you, but I'm celebrating that this morning. Let's continue to engage our hearts, especially in this next one, as we hear about what he did for us on the cross. Think about these truths. I believe in the sun, I believe in the risen one, I believe I overcome by the power of his blood, amen, amen. about his resurrection on Sunday morning and to be the people of the resurrection. Think about how does his story and our story link up as we sing this next one as well.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. And, and Lord, you are God of the universe. Lord, you are the, uh, the Lord of the heaven and the earth, Lord, and we just give you all the praises and thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. And Lord, please use these offerings to further your church here in Westfield and around the world, and we just give you all the praise. Amen. You may be seated, and if the kids would come forward. Okay, today we are starting the story. You've probably heard about this. And the story is taking the entire Bible from beginning to end and being able to tell it in a way that everybody can understand. And today, we're going to start at the very beginning. Does anybody know what that is? What is it, Kayla? Um, it's when God makes everything. So I'm going to tell you a little story using some illustrations and some science experiments because I loved science when I was in school. So God created the universe and when it first created it we really didn't know what it looked like because it said it was formless and void and god created so we have some stuff so i like to represent um our little world is this okay so what happened is is that god created and prepared the earth for people and people when they came into the earth god thought it was very good so this is people okay so once God created people, then he breathed life into them, and we have life. It worked. <laughs> yeah, you never know if it's going to light. So now we have life, and we have a world, and we have a universe. But that's not the end of the story. What begins is that the life becomes compromised when... Guys, back up. Everybody needs to be able to see. All those people want to see, too. You can sit. it okay so what happens is that this evil serpent shows up in the garden and, and tempts Eve to say hey you know God told you not to eat of this eat of this tree otherwise you would you would you would be it would be a bad thing and so Satan comes in and said that won't happen you can go ahead and eat that apple and as soon as she does sin comes into play Now, in science, if you watch the flame, there it goes. So what happens is, in science, when all of the air, when all of the air goes out of the jar, the flame goes out because it needs oxygen. Okay? So this illustration shows that when Satan comes into the picture, his ultimate goal is to get rid of life as God created it. But that's still not the end of the story, is it? Because even though we have sin in our lives, and there's usually a black spot on here, but it didn't show up. I wasn't, wasn't able to prepare it. But you can imagine a black spot on here. Sin stays with us wherever we go, even though the, 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 the cap is off of the world. Jesus comes along and wipes that sin away. And you know what God does with the sin? He gets rid of it. And he says, because I gave you Jesus, your light will always be there. If you just believe. If you just believe. Okay? So what I want you to remember is that sometimes, let me have it, please. Sometimes when there's sin in the world and it wants to cover you up, what you can do is believe in Jesus and the sin will be tossed away and forgotten. Can you remember that? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the creation story, and sometimes we take that story for take advantage of it, but as we will learn today in Pastor Dave's sermon, we will hear that your story is your attempt at creating fellowship with us to be our friend. And we pray that as we learn that we will be able to take sin and toss it away, and enjoy life with you eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. And, uh, thanks for uh, everybody's uh, being here today and our participation in the story. And, and uh, as we reflect about God and his creation, the beginning of life as we know it. Um, now, I, as we start out here today, I, I don't know if I, should, if I should say anything, but I'm going to take a risk anyway. 
because uh, um, Don Day just came back from the honor flight. So I wanted uh, us to acknowledge Don today and thanks for him uh, going on that. And uh, so, you want to say anything, Don? <laughs> Thumbs up? Okay. Well, thanks for, uh, I'm glad you were able to go and, and, uh, and uh, it was great to uh, see you come back and be able to say that. So, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks as we come into your worship service today to worship you and to give you the honor that's due your name. And we thank you that, that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And he said, everyone who believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And we thank you that, that you said, let there be light. And there was light. And... Uh, and we go on through the creation story and see that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we thank you for creating us. And we thank you for your love for us, your fatherly care for us, and for all of creation. And for this, we give you our worship and praise today. Thank you for, for Jesus, who gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins and restored uh, our fellowship with you. And we thank you that he took our sins away and buried them in the deepest oceans that I will remember their sins no more. And Lord, we give you thanks for your spirit that gives us guidance, brings order out of chaos, and uh, gives us l the... You, you breathed into man and made him a living soul. So we pray for your spirit to breathe on us today, that we might be filled with your spirit and with the fruit of the spirit of love and joy, peace and patience kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Restore your image within each one of us. Thank you for uh, each person here. Meet each person at the point of their need. Uh, meet, we pray for the healing for all those on our healing prayer list. Thank you for Don being able to go on the honor flight. and pray you bless him and his family and, and our nation as well. And we pray now the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
come to our time of scripture, we're going to be reading uh, two scripture passages, one from the Old, one from the New Testament. We'll be starting with Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then close with John chapter 1, 1 through 5. And if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Then from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Did you know there's baseball in the Bible? Yeah. In the beginning. It says in the beginning. That's bad. That's really bad. But uh, anyway, it's baseball season. Um, uh, we're, we're looking at the book of Genesis. And Genesis is, this, is the seed plot of the word of God. And Genesis, which is Greek, means origin. And the Hebrew uh, word for uh, Genesis is translated in the beginning. So Genesis is the book of beginnings. It is, uh, indicates its scope and the limits of the book. It tells us the beginning of everything except God. God is eternal. He always was, always has been, always will be. And so it tells us the beginning of everything except God. And upon the truths of Genesis are the rest of, re of Revelation built. And so without Genesis, our knowledge of a creating God would be pitifully limited and we'd be woefully ignorant of the beginnings of our universe. Genesis is the book of beginnings, the beginning of the world, the beginning of the human race, the beginning of sin in the world, the beginning of the promise of redemption, the beginning of family life, the beginning of man-made civilization, the beginning of the nations of the world, and the beginning of the Hebrew race. And Genesis gives us at least 2,000 years of record, and it's not entirely history. It is a spiritual interpretation of history. <clears throat> and in two chapters, God flashes on the wall the creation of the universe and of the world and everything, um, and, and also the creation of man. And from there we see it's a story of redemption, of God bringing a lost humanity back to himself. And so, um, Satan seems to have special enmity for the book of Genesis. Um, whoa, let there be no light. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and so it exposes him as the enemy of God and the deceiver of the human race. And Satan attacks mosaic authorship, uh, the... the scientific accuracy and its literal testimony to human sin as a deliberate choice to disobey God. And it's all been bitterly assailed. And the Word of God, however, declares that Genesis to be one of the living oracles delivered to Moses. And to the infallible truth and its testimony of the Messiah, our Lord has set his seal. He said, you know, you look to Moses, but Moses wrote about me, says Jesus. And Gen when Genesis goes, a divine redeemer, a divine creator, a divine creation, a divinely promised redeemer, a divinely inspired Bible, all have to go. But around the, the pages of Genesis, the Spirit of God gives his protection because they are his inspired words. And many origins are recorded in the first 11 chapters. The natural universe, human life, sin, death, redemption, civilization, nations, and languages. And so, won't you make the book of Genesis a new beginning? And as you study the book of Genesis over these weeks, uh, make a new love for the Lord in your own life. Genesis answers the great questions of the soul, the eternity of God. Where did man come from? 
Where did sin come from? How can sinful man get back to God? How can man please God? How can we have power with God and man? These are all answered in the book of Genesis. And we need to remember as we study the Old Testament, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we need to remember that the new is in the old concealed. And the old is in the new revealed. And we'll see Jesus on every page of the Bible. Jesus is the center of the Bible. He is somewhere on every page and he is in Genesis in type and prophecy. We see the Lord Jesus in type and prophecy in the seed of the woman, in the skins of the slain beast, in Abel's blood sacrifice, in the entrance into the ark of safety, and other places in the book of Genesis. Who wrote the book of Genesis? The, the age-long Hebrew and Christian position is that Moses, guided by the Spirit of God, wrote the book of Genesis. Where did he get the creation accounts? Who knows? Maybe Adam passed it on to Seth and on to... Noah and all them, and it got to Moses. But the first um, uh, verse of the Bible, untarnished through the ages, is Genesis 1 1. Want to read that with me? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, before we get into the creation story in the Bible, let me give you the creation story of the secular humanists, okay? Okay, here it is. In the beginning, once upon a time, there was a cosmic egg. Where'd the cosmic egg come from? Well, we don't know. Maybe it come from the cosmic chicken. But anyway, in the beginning, there was the cosmic egg. What's in the cosmic egg? Well, we don't know, but we think it contains 99.7% hydrogen gas, a little bit of helium, and uh, all the matter in the entire universe is in that cosmic egg. How big's the cosmic egg? Well, we don't know, but we think it's about the size of a period uh, on the printed page at the end of a sentence. All the matter in the universe is in the cosmic egg. And the cosmic egg got real hot. How did it get hot? Well, we don't know, but it got real hot and it exploded in a big bang. And hydrogen gas spread throughout the universe. And over billions and billions of years, turned into planets and plants and animals, eventually turned into people. <clears throat> now, the human brain is the most complex piece of matter in the universe. It contains 100 billion cells linked by synapses which each brain cell can be connected to tens of thousands of other brain cells making trillions of connections passing on complex information. So hydrogen gas is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas which, which if given enough time becomes people. Now I have a hard time believing that. But people do believe it. And we read in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And these few simple words, we have the Bible's declaration of the origin of the material universe. God called all things into being by the word of his power. He spoke and the worlds were framed. He spoke and the worlds leapt into existence. And interpretations of the method of God may vary, but the truth of the fact remains that God's creative work was progressive. We see God creates the world of matter. Then he creates life systems. And then we see the crown of God's creation is the creation of the man and woman in his own image. Do we have Genesis 1, 26 and 27? Uh, okay, let's, uh, you want to read it with me? Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, this is so interesting. Man and woman are the crowning achievement of God's creation. Now, let's say God is an artist, okay? And he's got, he's got the picture frame over here. Can you imagine God painting creation? Let there be light. And there was light. Steps back. Did you see this over and over in your reading? And God saw that it was good. And then he, then he you know, makes the plants, you know, and he steps back. Ah, oh, that's good. And he draws the birds and all the sea creatures. 
steps back, and that's good. And he does that several times. And then he creates man and a woman, and he steps back, and he goes, ah, it's very good. So the crowning achievement of God is people made in his own image. And he says that is very good. And who is the God mentioned so many times in the first 31 verses of Genesis? John 1.1, 1, 1, which we just read. John 1.1, 1, 1, want to read it with me? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Later on we read, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. That baby in the manger is the creator of the universe. That, that man who died on the cross made the universe. And He came to be our Redeemer and to redeem us by His precious blood. And someone has said that God the Father is the architect of creation, God the Son is the builder of creation, and God the Holy Spirit the beautifier of the universe. And so we see the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. God is a trinity. He's a trinity of persons. Did you read where it said, God says, let us make man in our image? People would go, when they first read the Bible, go, who's, who's he talking to? Is he talking to the angels? It's a dialogue among the Godhead. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God is one, but God is three. I don't understand it. But, but God is one and God is three. And the first verse of the Bible, you know, it's a trinity of trinities. God creates time, space, and matter. What time is past, present, and future? Space is height, depth, and width. Matter is solid, liquid, and gas. The, this, the stamp of the trinity of the triune God is upon all of creation. He is a marvelous creator. And the key to the Bible is hung right on the front door. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we'll never begin to exhaust the truth of this verse. We bring our little teacup minds to this great ocean of truth. And, and you must understand at least part of this. You, and you must believe all of it because it's so foundational to the rest of the Bible. And... Uh, so the first thing we see is a God who is presented. God is not argued or explained. The Bible doesn't try to prove God. The Bible assumes God. Okay? And there are no proofs. God doesn't need any proofs. Sometimes an atheist will come up to a believer and say, I don't believe in God. Prove God exists. And we don't really need to do anything except smile and say, prove God doesn't exist. You know? And, and, um, you see, God doesn't lie in the realm of proof. Trying to prove God uh, only through um, the material world would be like trying to dig through a piano to find the hallelujah chorus. You don't prove God. You don't disprove God. You believe in God. And if a person decides not to believe in God, they choose not to believe in God. And in Genesis 1, we also see a God who is powerful. He's the God of all creation. He's the God of all power. The Hebrew word for God created is bara, and it speaks of something only God can do. It says God created everything out of nothing. Nothing existed before, not time, space, or matter, or anything, and God created everything out of nothing. Now, the Latin word is ex nihilo. Everybody say that with me. Ex nihilo. Oh, good, you learned a theology word. God created everything out of nothing. And as we look at God's creation, how amazed we ought to be. Our bodies are made up of 37 trillion cells, each one more complex than New York City. The known universe is more than 10 billion light years across. That means if you got in a spaceship, traveled the speed of light for 10 billion years, you'd only cross the known universe. I mean, from the galaxies to the cell, you're just in awe of the creation of God. And the complexity overwhelms us. And God spoke it, and it was so. He made it all out of nothing. In a throwaway verse in the creation story, it said, God made the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And oh yeah, he made the stars too. People worship the sun. People worship the moon. People worship the stars. They say, oh, God made all that. 
you should worship God. Now, when I said there's no proofs for God, I didn't mean there's no evidences for God. You see, if someone sees a watch, they probably assume there's a watchmaker. You know? Let's say an engineer observes creation. What does he see or she see? Order, complexity, beauty, and design. You think there might be a designer? And third, we see the God who is purposeful. He had reasons for creating the heavens and the earth. And we don't have to guess what they are. He created everything for his pleasure. And he created things for his praise. So the trees lift their leafy arms and say, praise the Lord. And the, uh, the, the billows of the ocean, they, they move back and forth and they say, praise the Lord. And, and God made you and me to praise him as well. And God created all things for his people. He made all good things for our enjoyment. You know, Christians are boring. They don't enjoy anything. God made all good things for our enjoyment. And so uh, Genesis 1-1 also presents the God who is personal. God is a spirit. He also has the characteristics of personhood, intelligence, emotion, and will. And he's not some impersonal being or force. And when it says, in the beginning, God, the word is Elohim. It's a Hebrew word for God. Uh, he created the heavens and the earth. And it's made up of two compound words, El, which speaks of God's strength and unlimited power. And the last part of the word means to keep a promise or covenant. So you put them together, and God's name means the God in whom nothing is impossible and who always keeps his word. Isn't that great? And this personal God has chosen to reveal himself to us. God has given everybody an innate sense that somebody probably made this world. You know, they're, they're probably. Yeah. And, and God has sent Jesus to earth to reveal the Father to us. And the Bible also speaks of God as a faithful creator. He's not just going to create the world, fling it out into the universe, and let it go. No, he made it, and he's going to care for it. And the God who is powerful and personal and purposeful made you and me for a purpose. And he's going to watch over you, and he's going to take care of you. And aren't you glad we have a God like that? And we're introduced to this God in the very first verse of the Bible. And in chapter 1, we have the account of creation in outline. And then in chapter 2, it's further detail about the creation of the man and the woman. And God created man in his own image to have fellowship with himself. But man cut himself off from God by sin. And when, only when sin is removed can fellowship be restored. And that's why Jesus Christ came to earth that he might bear our own sins in his body on the tree and remove our sins so that we can be restored in fellowship with God. First John talks about how sin keeps us out of fellowship with God and with one another, and it tells us how to be restored in fellowship. First John 1 John 1.9 says, says uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, Adam and Eve were created in a state of innocence, but with the power of choice. A Sunday school teacher asked the kids in her class, who was the first man? The kids said, George Washington. The teacher said, no, it wasn't George Washington, it was Adam. The kids said, well, maybe if he was a foreigner. Well, anyway, uh, Adam and Eve were created in a state of innocence. With the power of choice, they were tested under the most favorable circumstances. They were endowed with clear minds, pure hearts, and the ability to do right. And God came down and gave them his own personal presence. He said they walked with God in the cool of the day. Can you imagine that? God come down and walk with them in the cool of the day. And then Satan comes in. Now they might have been able to obey God better, but Satan comes in, the author of sin, acting through a serpent. People wonder, well, where, where'd all the evil come? God must value free will pretty highly to give angels and people free will. And Satan rebelled, and then he tempted humans to rebel, and they did the same thing. And he tempted them 
to doubt God's word. He comes up to Eve and says, Eve, did God really say? Did God really say that? And he tempted Eve. And because she doubted God, she doubted his word, they yielded to the temptation and failed in the test. And here sin enters the world. And Satan still influences men and women to disobey God today. And the results of their sin are enumerated in Genesis 3. They were separated from God, the ground was cursed, and sorrow filled their hearts. In mercy, God promised one who would redeem men and women from sin. Now this is in Genesis 3.15. This is, a very, this is called the proto-evangel. In other words, the first proclamation of a gospel. It's a veiled reference. You want to read it with me? And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now the NIV, term, uh, her offspring, it, it, was, it was usually translated the seed of the woman. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, everywhere else in the Bible talks about the seed of the man. So, the, the rabbis puzzled over this. The Messiah must be born of a woman without a human father. And this is what we see in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Now, you really don't have a problem with the virgin birth if you, have pro if you don't have problems with God being the creator, you know. And the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, had a supernatural entrance into this world, the virgin conception, the virgin birth. He died an atoning death on the cross and had a supernatural exit from this world, the resurrection and the ascension. And so God is promising the coming of a Redeemer who will destroy the works of Satan. You see, Jesus Christ died on the cross to take our sins, and in his resurrection, he crushed the head of Satan but Jesus was bruised through the process. You know what I mean? And so 1 John 3, 8 tells us why Jesus Christ came into the world. Want to read it with me? He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And, and the devil hates life. He doesn't like people, and he doesn't want people restored to God. And so... Uh, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, in Genesis 3.21 contains a picture in miniature of the whole plan of redemption for man through the shed blood of our substitutes. The coat of skin could not have uh, been obtained except through the death of an innocent victim. And it shows us that, that there is no covering for sin except by the blood. So Genesis 3.21, you want to read that with me? The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Okay, so what we have here is a picture of what Christ did for us. Adam, Adam and Eve are separated from God because of their sin. But God makes a way back. This is the first death in the Bible. God takes an innocent animal and slays the animal. The innocent die for the guilty. And then they're clothed in the, in the skins of the animal. Jesus Christ died as our substitute on the cross and we are clothed in his righteousness and because of that we're restored to a relationship with God. And immediately after the fall then, men began to offer sacrifices to the Lord. No doubt these sacrifices were ordered by God and the purpose was to keep before man the fact of his fall and that there would be a coming sacrifice. All the sacrifices in the Old Testament point to what Christ would do. Now we look back to what Christ has done. And it would be by the shedding of his blood that, he would be, that we would be redeemed from sin and death. Hebrews 9.22. Um, uh, we can read that. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, Adam and Eve, they're driven from the garden. And uh, part of this, that even being driven from the garden and death is part of God's grace as well. Because he said, now they become like us. Now if they take from the tree of life, they'll live forever. So he drives them from the garden so they can't take of the tree of life and live forever. Can you imagine if sin lived forever? Can you imagine if Hitler was still in charge? Can you imagine if these kind of, if, if wickedness got to live forever? But because of death, sin has a limit. Anyway, um, um, Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel. And, and, through, and then uh, 
they brought their sacrifices to the Lord. And it says that Cain brought the fruit of the ground, Abel brought the firstlings of the flock, and Abel's offering was accepted while Cain's was rejected. And from our knowledge, why was Cain, that always bugged me when I was a kid, why was Cain's offering rejected? He was a farmer, he brought what he brought, and Abel was a herd, herdsman, and he brought what he had. Well, it was rejected because of what we know of the Bible, because it was not typical of the sacrifice that was afterwards offered on Calvary. And Cain became angry with his brother Abel, and in his wrath he killed him. Now, important verse, uh, Genesis 4, 6, and 7. So, God accepts Abel's offering, doesn't accept Cain's. And Cain is really angry. He's mad. God didn't accept my offering, accept Abel's. I don't like Abel. He makes me mad. So, uh, uh, God comes and says this to him. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? In other words, if you come by a blood sacrifice, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Isn't this a great picture of sin? It's crouching at the door, and it's ready to jump on your back and keep you in its clutches forever and eat your lunch. And that's exactly what happened to Cain. God said, sin is crouching at the door, and it desires to have you. Now, for some people, it may be anger. For Cain, it was envy and jealousy. For others, it may be lust. For others, it may be laziness. For others, it may be greed and selfish ambition. In Judas's case, if you remember one of the 12 disciples, it was greed and selfish ambition. And, and sin's crouching at the door. It's ready to have you, but you must master it. And it's almost like God saying there, I'll help you. Call on my name, and I'll help you. But he does it, and sin takes over Cain. Hey, Abel, come on out in the field with me. Hey, buddy. He turns around, takes a rock, and bashes it over his head and kills him. Kills his brother. This is the first death of a human in the Bible. Can you imagine how stunned uh, they were about this? And so, <clears throat> the story of Cain and Abel reveals a biblical principle that we can only approach God on the basis of a blood atonement. And Cain, uh, the farmer, worked hard in the noonday sun. He worked hard plowing and planting and cultivating and weeding and hoeing. And he brought the best fruit of his labor to worship God, the most beautiful flowers, the most fragrant herbs, the most luscious vegetables, the ripest fruit. He propped them all up there before the Lord as his offering. And his spread must have been impressive. It would probably look like a county fair. But Cain represents salvation by works, where he tries to be right with God by what he does. Cain's idea of worship did not come from the revealed Word of God. It came from his own noggin. It came from his own ideas. So here's Cain with his own man-made religion, his works, and his rituals. And it was beautiful, and it was cultured, and it was gorgeous, and it was sacrificial, but it was not accepted. God says, not accepted. If you do what's right, won't you be accepted? But it was not accepted. Abel, the shepherd, took a little animal, probably a lamb, maybe a spotless lamb, and with shed blood, worshiped the Lord. The New Testament says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And Jesus called Abel a prophet because his actions foretold the blood sacrifice our Lord himself would make. And so Abel's story is the, is the first story in the scarlet thread of redemption we see through the Old Testament. Some people say, well, you know, I'm looking for a religion that suits me. They better look for a religion that suits God. Because God is the one who, who makes the conditions. And he says, you only approach me through a blood sacrifice. Anybody know why we pray in Jesus' name? We pray to the Father through the Son because we only have access to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. <laughs> and so, people, God is the one who shows us how to worship Him. And the difference between false religion and real salvation is that religion is rooted in what man tries to do for God. 
But salvation is rooted in what God does for man. One is spelled do, the other is spelled done. God said, there's my son on the cross dying for your sins. Accept him, receive him. If you do what's right, won't you be accepted? But if we reject Christ and try to come some other way, God will say to us, not accept it. He's made his way known, and it's through what he's done for us on the cross. And long after Cain died, the New Testament counts uh, the terrible mistake that Cain made through pride and willful disobedience. And the difference between Cain and Abel is the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness. The difference between acceptability and unacceptability. It's the difference between heaven and hell. And maybe people say, I'm a good person. I go to the right church. I give my money. I read the Bible. I pray. Look what I do, God. God says, all that's good, not accepted. We can never be saved by the work of our own hands. We're saved by what God did for us on the cross, by His grace. And then we do these other things in response to grace. You know, uh, God, I give, I give you my worship. I go to church. I give. I read the Bible in thankfulness for what you did for me on the cross. Not to be accepted by you. Because I, he accepts us through Jesus Christ. Now, because of what Cain did, God punished him, but be tempered it with mercy. He, he said, okay, you're, you're banished. You got to go. I'm going to put a, what They're going to kill me, God. So he puts a mark on his head. It's a mark on his head so people don't kill him. So Cain goes off and starts his own civilization. But this is where we think the first writings began. You ever heard of like, like um, people noticed that the marks and signs and pictures could use to be record ideas, words, combinations of words. And these pictures were made on pottery, on hard clay. And in the prehistoric cities of Babylonia, the oldest known writings are pictures on clay tablets. And so we think this is where the beginning of writing began. And then long before God gave the law to Moses, we find several definite ordinances given in the book of Genesis. At the very beginning, God instituted the Sabbath. Genesis 2, uh, 1, to, 1 to 3, okay? And you'll notice God, God created in six days. He created everything six days, rested on the seventh. Why did he do that? Why didn't he just create everything in six seconds, you know? Well, he did it as a pattern for us. He said, work six days, worship and rest on the seventh. You want to read it with me? Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, you know, this shows that God is not an unpleasable taskmaster. He's not a cosmic killjoy, you know. Well, if I follow God, life's going to be boring. God, God created in six days, and he goes, step, why did God quit creating? Did he get tired? Did God get tired? No, God doesn't get tired. He steps back, and he goes, I'm going to enjoy my creation, and I'm going to enjoy the people I've made. And so he said, I'm instituting the Sabbath. So that you have a day to rest and to enjoy me and to enjoy one another. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. To restore body and soul. And, God, and, and Jesus said, God established the Sabbath for man. And so that's a pattern that God brings into our life. And another thing that God established was marriage. Genesis 2.24. I'm read it with me. For this reason, man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife... And they will become one flesh. So God institutes marriage. He institutes marriage between a man and a woman. And that's the creation account. In Genesis 2.24, um, a little bit before that, he says, uh, God created man. He breathed into him the breath of life. Then he goes, it's not good. For this is the only time in the Bible God says something's not good. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. So, you know, he puts Adam to sleep, takes out a rib, makes a woman, you know. Then he brings the woman to the man. God brings the man and the woman together. And you ever wonder why all these love songs on the radio, people singing about love, 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 love. 
I love her, you know, and, and, and that's, what, that's what Adam does. He breaks out in poetry. He goes, ah, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She should become a woman because she was taken out of man. In other, in other words, wow, she's really something else, you know. And she's just like me, and we're made for each other. And that's what he's, that's what he's saying. So God institutes marriage. And God also seems to institute the tithe, we'll see later. And he, God is making clear from the beginning that human beings are only stewards of, of the earth that he has made. Now, if we go on, the civilization before the flood is called the antediluvian civilization. It perished in the judgment of the flood and was a civilization started by Cain. Now, these early people before the flood were not mere savages. They were, had, con, had a considerable degree of civilization, and everything in the material civiliz, civilization is touched on in Genesis. Before the flood, there were herdsmen, there were musicians, there were artists and manufacturers, there were builders, and the civilization founded by Cain may have been equal to that of Greece or Rome. We don't really know, but God's, God's judgment was upon it. And so then we get into the account of the flood, and evil had grown rampant throughout the earth. And only one righteous person remained. His name was Noah. And God sent the flood to restore good upon the earth. And Adam and Eve had yielded to an outward temptation. Now because of the broken image of God were made in the image of fallen Adam. People are given into their inward uh, temptations from within. And Genesis 6, 5, and 6. Uh, you want to read it with me? The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. You see, this shows God is not an unmoved mover, that he cares, that, that he was grieved, and his heart was filled with pain. These people are so violent and wicked and everything, they forgot about God, they don't care about God. So God calls Noah, and oh, Genesis 6, 8, we ought to read that one. Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Another version says Noah found grace. It's the first word for grace we see in the Bible. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was blameless in his generation, which was pretty wicked. So we don't know how good, Adam, <laughs> how good he was, but he was good enough for God to say, you know, hey, look, um, the earth is so wicked, I got to start over, but I'm going to start with you. So Noah, start building an ark. Can you imagine a guy building a big boat out in the middle of Iowa or somewhere? People, this guy's crazy, nuttier than a fruitcake. And, and uh, God had been long-suffering his patience with men. The Holy Spirit had striven with them. And Noah, while he built the ark, preached for 120 years. God's going to bring judgment on the world. Get on the ark. It's the only safe place. God said to get on the ark. And uh, even after Noah and his wife and three sons and their wives, taking with them two of every unclean animal, 14 of every clean animal, they entered the ark. There was a respite for seven days before the flood. It's almost like God's going, seven more days, get on the ark. People say, oh, the God of the Old Testament, he's mean. He doesn't have any patience at all. Do you think 120 years waiting for people to repent is long-suffering, patient, no saying, get on the ark. But God's mercies were refused, and so men perished in the flood. And Noah was saved from the flood by the ark. And this is a type of Christ. Christ is our ark of safety. As all the people who were on the ark were saved, all those outside the ark were doomed to the flood waters of the judgment of God. And God's saying in our day, come to Christ. He is the ark of safety. When you come to Him, you enter into a relationship with God and you're safe. Otherwise, outside of Christ, you're under the judgment of God. Now, the interesting thing to me is, is it says in the Bible, in the NIV, it says, and God shut them in. Other versions say, and God closed the door. So it's not up to me to close the door. I don't think anybody is beyond hope until God closes the door. It could be by their own hardness of heart they've rejected God. It could be at the second coming of Christ when it's all over with. It could be at their death. But it's never over till God closes the door. 
And God closed the door, and the flood came, and Noah and his family were safe in the ark. And after the ark, after the flood waters seceded, uh, the, um, the ark landed on Mount Ararat, Ararat and, uh, and, and Noah erected an altar to worship God, made sacrifices to God. They were pleasing to God. And after God saves us, we should worship God. We should worship Jesus Christ for what he did for us. And we should worship and give God honor. And God put a rainbow in the sky as a covenant saying, I'll never destroy the earth by a flood again. And then God gave human government after this for, for men to rule the earth. And he also, the most important thing, probably the most responsible thing he did uh, that's, that's kind of scary is Genesis 9, 6, where uh, he says uh, this, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed. For the image of God, God has made man. You see, God didn't kill Cain when he killed Abel. But the world had become so wicked, people were killing one another right and left for human civilization to flourish. The image of God is so important. God said, you kill someone made in my image, you forfeit your life as well. Now, I don't want to get into all the politics of that, but that was uh, the original uh, capital punishment um, decree from, from the Lord on that one. So all who were in the ark were saved. All who were outside the ark were doomed. God said, I'm making a way back. It's open to all people. It is a narrow way. You only come to God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You get on the ark of safety by receiving Christ as your Savior and as your risen Lord. And so let's, let's pray together as we uh, end our time today. Lord, we thank you that you're the God of all creation. And you love us with an everlasting love. And even though we've sinned against you, just as our first parents did, you have made a way back to yourself. And you said that it is by the blood. We have to come to you through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he is our ark of safety. So Lord, we come to you for forgiveness of sins, to receive you as our Savior, to trust you as our Lord. So we look to you to guide our lives and help us to enjoy your presence as they did in the Garden of Eden in innocence. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
if you need those and uh, go now in the grace, mercy and love of the Father, the sacrificial death of the Son and the cleansing and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>